2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 through 15. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this is a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. Welcome to episode 19 of our series on 2 Corinthians. Last week, we concluded by saying that the generosity Paul commends to us is firmly rooted in what we have already received in Christ Jesus. We're going to explore this idea at just a little greater depth as we take a look at chapter 8, verses 7 through 15. In the end, we Christians see in the person of Jesus an overwhelming vision of the generous heart of God, beckoning us all to reflect that same generosity. Before we begin, let us pray. God of the gift, we give you thanks for all we have received in Jesus Christ. As we reflect on your word, help us see the depths of your love present in him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is Wednesday, December 2nd, 2020. Yesterday was Tuesday, and while the date wasn't as important, the whole nation was awash in appeals to give to charities on what we are now calling Giving Tuesday. I'm all about generosity, don't get me wrong. As I said last week, the more we learn to give ourselves away, the more we discover what we have in Jesus Christ. That said, I'm finding it very entertaining, to say the least, that Giving Tuesday was plastered all over the internet and social media, preceded the day before, of course, by Cyber Monday, the busiest day for online buying and selling in the calendar year. Cyber Monday was preceded by the first Sunday of Advent, but that didn't get the same amount of attention. Sunday was preceded by a Saturday of no real import, evidently, but Friday, well, Friday was a truly monumental day for our society, Black Friday. People got up at 3 or 4 a.m. to make their way to get that low-priced television they saw last week. I'm thankful that I haven't seen any of the reports of violence as in years previous, and all of this litany of consumption was kicked off on what we probably should call Overeating Thursday, a.k.a. Thanksgiving. I know my analysis is a little ridiculous, and yes, I'm probably guilty of using this bully pulpit to shame us all. Sorry. But, you know, I point the finger squarely at myself. Lord knows I ate my fill on Thanksgiving. But I have a deeper point. What I have noticed happen in our culture over the last decade or so is that we have grown accustomed to siloing everything. We are content to set aside one day for giving thanks, followed by one day of shop till you drop a success, is followed by the next business day with all you can scroll internet shopping, and now we have a day to silo all of our giving so maybe, just maybe, we might feel a little bit better about ourselves and all that consumption we've spent the prior days getting under our belts quite literally. While I absolutely support the fact that we ought to give, I am saddened that our culture has become so consumer-oriented that even generosity itself seems to be co-opted by the logic of boom, bust, famine, feast. I fear what confining generosity like this pretends for us all. Now let's take up chapter 8, starting in verse 7. As we discussed last week, Paul is appealing to this wealthy community in Corinth to fulfill the promises they have made to support their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. The simple truth of the matter is that Paul is not very good at asking others for or talking about money at all. 
He will spend these entire two chapters talking around the subject, doing what he did last week, appealing to their pride by comparing the generosity of the poor churches in Macedonia with their chintzy disposition. In this section, he continues with this appeal, but he does it using, finally, a wonderfully beautiful tactic. Yes, he tells them in verse 7, they have so much that it overflows. No, he tells them in verse 8, he isn't commanding them. He's only testing out their seriousness. On and on he has gone, gone and will go on as he dances around what should be a straight ask for support. But again, he does the most beautiful thing in verse 9. He points to the cross. He points to Jesus. At the heart of the gospel story is the simple reality that God has been overly generous with us. In no way have we deserved this wondrous grace. We are all paupers before God. Nevertheless, while we are paupers, in Christ we have been given everything. Out of the overflowing abundance of grace that is the love of God came the Lord Jesus Christ who took on our poverty so that we might be elevated in status and become full heirs within the household of God. The grace of God was not, nor has God ever been content to silo his grace to a particular people or a specific time. In Jesus, every day is a gift and an opportunity to give. If we as the people of God can get our heads around this logic of grace and our hearts detached from the logic of consumption, we might begin moving a little closer to what our communities might look like as Paul describes them in verses 14 and 15. When our hearts are unlocked by the deep generosity of grace, our abundance fills the need of others because their need is the beck and call of grace to allow love to flow between us. In other words, it is out of the give and take of life shared together as one body in the power of the Spirit. It's in the ebb and flow of need and abundance that the bonds of fellowship are stitched together and grow as brothers and sisters learn to care for one another. A community centered on the grace of a king who became poor so that we might become rich is a group of men and women who seek ways to enrich the lives and hearts of their brothers and sisters, and all are fed and made whole. A community of believers oriented to live this way become wellsprings of life in a world busy siloing everything around endless consumption, exhaustion, and collapse. Let us pray. Father, we sincerely thank you that you sent your son to take on our poverty so that we might be welcome into abundant fellowship with you. Help us share from our abundance so that we and our neighbor might grow together in the love of Jesus Christ. Amen.